Hello, the third topic is devoted to the period in which Western medicine was born and began its development. It is about the time when a rational approach to understanding the disease began to prevail over the mystical. This period consists of three main sections. It is considered that rational medicine began with ancient Greek physician Hippocrates, because he was the first to separate medicine from religion and to understand disease rationally. In classical antiquity, which is the period of ancient Greece and Rome, the thirst for knowledge of nature led to the flourishing of rational medicine. In the medieval period, when power in Europe was concentrated in the hands of church, the mystical understanding of health and disease returned to Europe, making antique medical thoughts forgotten for a long time. But the young Islamic civilization kept the Greek traditions from falling, making possible its return to Europe. The cataclysm and the end of the medieval ages caused the revival of antique knowledge and return to a rational approach in medicine. Historian called this period the scientific revolution, and it consisted of two stages, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. In this part of the lecture, we are going to talk about the first stage in the development of rational medicine namely the medical tradition of the first great European civilizations, Greek and Roman. As in previous periods, in ancient Greece medicine was also initially based on the belief in the supernatural origin of diseases. Asclepius was considered the ancient Greek god of healing. Temple complexes, called Asclepians, were dedicated to him. Their most common treatment was dream incubation, that is, treatment in dreams during sleep. Patients would have come to this temple, saw numerous stories about miraculous healings on the walls, talked with overseers of the temple, and then went to bed in the evening, hoping that Asclepius himself would come to them in dreams and cure their illnesses. It was believed that even if Asclepius didn't appear, he would have sent his serpents, which would inspire the sick with dreams of healing. In the morning, the temple priests would have asked patients about those dreams and tried to unravel them. So understanding of health and disease was quite mystical in the early history of Greece. But in the 5th century before Common Era, there were doctors who no longer wanted to believe in supernatural causes of disease. One of them was Hippocrates from the island of Kos. He criticized mystical approach in medicine and insisted that only with reasoning the cause of diseases can be discovered, and only human mind can be useful in search for a way to treat patient. Therefore, his approach is called rational, from the Latin ratio, which means reason. Thus, Hippocrates became the starting point of the approach that shaped Western medicine, namely the separation of medicine from mysticism. But we have to understand that if for his times Hippocrates' ideas appear to be progressive and rational, in our times many of what he thought to be rational looks still pretty mystical and primitive. The poor knowledge of human anatomy and physiology held medicine back and didn't let it completely free itself from the outdated worldview. Hippocrates expressed his rational thoughts in many books. After him, his students and followers expanded this set of books with great amount of their own works. But their names didn't survive. So later, all this primary set of books on Greek rational medicine received a general name, the Hippocratic Corpus. In total, this corpus includes about 70 books, but no one knows which of them were written by Hippocrates himself and which by his followers. The main concepts that are expressed in this corpus are rationalization of disease, 
the idea of health as a balance of liquids in the human body, the ability of human organism to heal itself with the help of nature, and the holistic approach to the patient. Hippocrates saw the cause of disease not in supernatural forces like many of physicians of his times did, but in natural factors. His attitude to mystical medicine is brightly expressed in his famous book on epilepsy. Ancient Greeks considered this disease sacred because they believed that epileptics were possessed by gods. Hippocrates opposed this idea. In his book The Sacred Disease, he concluded that every disease is wonderful in its own way, but none of them are sacred. Furthermore, he attacked physicians who practice old mystical medicine and called them witch doctors, faith healers, and charlatans who are just trying to hide their ignorance by invoking divine forces into medicine. So he was the first to try to exclude spiritual healing from medical practice. Hippocrates named the brain as the real source of the epileptic seizure and thus became the first one to connect the consciousness and mental functions of a person with the brain and not with the liver or heart as Mesopotamians and Egyptians did. However, this idea of Hippocrates was ahead of its time. After only a century, another Greek scholar, Aristotle, made observations of chicken embryogenesis and noted that the first movement of living being occurs in the heart. Therefore, he opposed the idea of Hippocrates and the heart again began to be considered as the center of life. And even now our language keeps the memory of this ancient idea, because we often attribute feelings such as love, fear and excitement to our heart but not to our brain. Despite the fact that Hippocrates correctly pointed out the origin of epilepsy from the brain, he attributed the cause of this disease not to abnormal electrical activity in the brain as we now know, but to the imbalance of internal substances, namely to an excess of fluid which led to the blockage of airflow to body parts. In his opinion, this blockage caused numbness of the limbs and shutdown of the brain. In confirmation of his idea, Hippocrates pointed out to a typical for epileptic seizure extensive drooling and foaming at the mouth. He interpreted these symptoms as the body's attempt to get rid of excessive fluids. So it indicates that just like prehistoric people and first civilizations, Hippocrates and his followers believed that health was in balance and disease was in imbalance. The only difference was in that the Hippocrates understood the balance in body not as proportional amount of energy or different substances, but as the balance of specifically fluids. But in the Hippocratic corpus, the idea of balance wasn't presented in a systematic way perhaps because it was well-known and didn't need to be clarified for the ancient Greek medics. Only many centuries later, in Roman times, when Hippocratic medicine began to be more and more theorized, another Greek physician, Galen, systematized, commented and expanded all the knowledge from Greek writings and introduced the so-called humoral theory because in Latin the word humor meant liquid. So it was the theory of the balance of four liquids in human body. This theory dominated Western medicine and served as the basis for understanding health and disease for many centuries, until its refutation in the second half of the 19th century. So, let's talk about the general idea of the humoral theory. The four humors, or fluids, were considered by Greeks to be blood, phlegm, black bile and yellow bile. Just like in any other balanced system, these substances were perceived 
as a reflection of the universal elements in humans, namely air, water, earth and fire. Balance of these elements changed during the year. Having different attributes, the prevalent elements believed to influence the weather and create specific season. For example, the Greeks believed that the prevalence of fire brings dryness and warmth and creates the summer season. The autumn is the season of air that brings warm wind and rains. Water brings moisture and cold and creates winter season. In spring, the earth element takes prevalence and brings cold and dryness. Greeks believed that these shifts of dominance of specific universal elements influence the balance of the corresponding fluids in the human body. For example, they believed that the element of water in winter increased phlegm levels in the human body and led to colds. A clear proof of this idea was a wet cough. Basically, wet cough is a phlegm in the throat. So it was believed by Greeks that with wet cough, organism is trying to get rid of excessive phlegm in body. Accordingly, in order to help organism to restore balance in winter, Greek medics suggested to apply opposites of moisture and cold, namely dryness and warmth. Analogically, treatments were assigned as oppositions to the active elements of the seasons. Warm drinks in spring, as opposite to coldness and dryness of earth, cold drinks at summer, as opposites to fire, and dry cold food in autumn, as opposites to air element. This is very simplified representation of humoral theory. In reality, it was much more detailed and the year was divided not only into four seasons, but also into many astrological phases. So, just as in Mesopotamia, Greek medicine was largely dependent on astrology. In the Hippocratic Corpus, we can find a lot of advice under which constellation specific disease would be treated more effectively. This approach has been preserved in Western medicine for a very long time. And even now, some doctors believe that certain constellation can affect the success of the treatment. According to humoral theory, to restore balance in body, physicians had to identify the excessive fluid and return it to normal state. For example, to get rid of excessive phlegm or bile, the Hippocrates prescribed diuretics, vomiting and laxatives. But most of diseases were attributed to excessive blood, and the best way to get rid of the excessive blood was bloodletting. So with time, this method of treatment was becoming more and more popular in Western medicine. In medieval times, some uneducated medics tried to cure with bloodletting any disease, starting from cold and ending with plague. Even in the first half of the 19th century, bloodletting continued to be one of the most applied methods of medical treatment in European clinics. We will talk later about why this false knowledge preserved in medicine for so long, but now let's dwell on why people believed in them at first place. There was a Latin saying that describes this phenomenon very precisely. It was past hoc ergo propter hoc, which means after that and therefore as a result of that. According to this way of thinking, if the method was applied, and the result was achieved, then the result was achieved because of the applied method. So, for example, if a patient had a flu and recovered few days after doctor applied bloodletting to him, then that was taken as a proof that bloodletting worked. Now we know that it was immune system that overcame the flu virus in a few days, and that bloodletting was not only useless in this case for patient, but could even harm him. By this archaic way of thinking, one can put any method 
instead of bloodletting, and the result would have been the same. Spiritual healers in Mesopotamia practiced prayers and incantations, Egyptians practiced anima, Chinese medics practiced acupuncture, and all of them in many cases achieved success that in reality belongs not to them, but to the healing abilities of human organism itself. Only in 19th century French physician Pierre Louis opposed this way of thinking and proposed to prove effectiveness of medical treatment not by a single experience, but by comparing hundreds and even thousands of clinical cases. He proved that bloodletting was not effective at all and that some diseases could have been cured faster and effectively even without any intervention than with bloodletting. But until that time, primitive methods in medicine prevailed. But the interesting part of this story is that Hippocrates understood the ability of human organism to cure itself. In his writings, he mentioned the idea that in many cases human body can heal itself, and that physicians shouldn't interfere in this process, but only help organism to do its job. Hippocrates understood human as a whole, and but the interesting part of this story is that Hippocrates understood the ability of human organism to cure itself. In his writings, he mentioned the idea that in many cases human body can heal itself, and that physicians shouldn't interfere in this process, but only help organism to do its job. Hippocrates understood human as a whole, inseparable being, exposed to the influences of internal and external imbalances. He expressed the thought that the nature is the true physician of diseases, and that doctors should treat patients and not their diseases. By that he meant that the true purpose of medical care is to understand the patient as a unique being identify the source of the illness and create environment in which illness will vanish by the force of nature. That's why he recommended physicians to pay close attention to the environment in which patient lives. His lifestyle, character, appearance, habits, and then listen carefully to what he tells about his illness. The aim of this procedure, according to Hippocrates, was to understand the patient rather than to classify his illness. In other words, he emphasized that the patient is the one who should be treated and not his disease. But this Hippocratic patient-centered approach was soon faded and replaced with the search for quick and universal healing practices, like purifications and excessive bloodlettings. But almost in every historical period, there were physicians who adhered to Hippocratic approach and insisted on the need of focusing on the patient rather than on the disease. In our time, when patient-oriented medicine is becoming relevant in Western medicine, the views of Hippocrates are becoming increasingly popular. Let's move on to the next stage of the development of Greek medicine. We know that under the Alexander the Great, the Greek state considerably expanded. After he captured the Egypt in 4th century before Common Era, Alexander wanted to create a Hellenistic center in Africa. So he built a new large city on Egyptian shore and called it Alexandria. After Alexander's death, his general Ptolemy took Egyptian lands and made Alexandria his capital. Under his rule, in just one century, Alexandria became the largest city in the world, populated by people from all over the Greece. Ptolemy himself was a historian and scientist, and therefore respected the art of science. In Alexandria, he created a world's biggest scientific center, called Museum. It was something like a modern university complex, which had buildings for study, lectures, scientific discussions and experiments. One of the most important part of this scientific center was the Alexandrian Library, that contained the largest collection of written sources of that time. 
Another part of museum that is specifically interesting for us was the medical school. Under the patronage of Ptolemy, Museon became the largest scientific center which attracted the most prominent scholars and students from all over the Greece. One of the students was Herophilos of Chalcedon, who received his medical education at Museon and became a teacher and scholar himself. He wrote a lot of books on different medical topics, from Pauls to midwifery, but his true passion was human anatomy. The sections of human body were forbidden in most places of the world at the time, but Alexandrian ruler was so supportive for science that he permitted Herophilus not only to dissect corpses, but even to perform vivisections, which is dissecting living beings. It is believed that for that matter Herophilus used prisoners who were sentenced to death. So Herophilus became the first physician in history to systematically perform scientific dissections of human bodies. That allowed him to make a significant breakthrough in anatomy and physiology. For example, he was the first to discover nerves, their role and their connection to the brain, proving that Hippocrates was right when he told that the brain is the most important part of the body, and not Aristotle, who attributed this role to the heart. Many internal organs were discovered and named by Herophilus. For example, the duodenum means 12 fingers, and it was named like this because Herophilus measured it with his fingers and counted 12. So every time you will see duodenum in your medical study and career, you can recall that more than 2,000 years ago, Greek physician Herophilus was putting his fingers on the same organ. Along with Herophilus at Alexandrian School of Medicine worked another prominent physician, Erasistratus. Together with Herophilus, he systematically performed autopsies and vivisections to study anatomy, as well as nerves and circulatory system. He was the first to describe valves of the heart. He supported Herophilus and concluded that heart was not the center of sensations, but that it functioned as a pump. Erasistratus was among the first to distinguish between veins and arteries, but he believed that unlike veins, arteries carry not blood but air. That is why he called them like that, because arteria means windpipe in Greek. It is believed that Erasistratus became the first Greek physician to oppose the humoral theory. Because delving into the real anatomy and physiology of human body, he didn't see any balance of fluids, nor did he see any wholeness of human body. Instead, he suggested that body was composed of little pieces, atoms, that as he thought were fitted with air by nerves connected to arteries. Unfortunately, the works of Herophilus and Erasistratus have not preserved. In the consequent centuries, Alexandria underwent many wars, fires and destructions. The Alexandrian library was destroyed and most of its scrolls were lost forever. Nevertheless, some ideas of Herophilus and Erasistratus preserved in the works of other authors, who cited or criticized them. But until the Renaissance, no one repeated the practice of these two Greek scholars to systematically and openly dissect human bodies with scientific purposes. Let's move on to the next stage of the development of antique medicine, the Roman time. In Rome, Greek medical tradition continued to develop, because medical services there was almost entirely in the hands of the Greek physicians. There are two versions of the origin of this trend. One is mythical and another is more realistic. Let's start with the mythical one. According to ancient myth, some major epidemic occurred in the city of Rome. To save the city from extinction, Romans ordered a statue of Greek god of medicine, Asclepius. In Greece, when statue was loaded on a Roman ship, a snake crawled into the ship. 
Since snakes were considered the personification of Asclepius, salesmen didn't dare to harm the snake and took it with them in the journey to Italy. In Rome, snake jumped off the boat into the Tiber River and crawled onto a small island. After that, the pandemic ceased. At the very place where snake landed, the Romans founded a temple of Asclepius and a hospital. Today, thousands of years later, a medical facility continues to exist on this very island in the middle of Rome. But the reality was more simple and prosaic. First of all, the Romans considered medical practice not prestigious. Second of all, they knew that the best doctors in the Mediterranean region were Greeks. And since they had war with Greeks and captured many Greek slaves, medical services were entrusted to them. Wealthy Romans generously rewarded their physicians for successful treatment. Also, since Romans didn't care much about medical theories, they didn't interfere in medicine and therefore the Greeks could practice any progressive methods of treatment, even those that were not allowed in their motherland. All this made Rome a very attractive place for Greek physicians, and many of them started to migrate to Roman lands by their own will. One of the first known Greek physicians in Rome was Asclepiades of Bithynia. He was a true follower of Hippocrates. He considered the patient his first priority and therefore prescribed easy and painless treatment. It is believed that during his treatment processes he liked to repeat the phrase cito tuto et jucunde, which means quick, safe and joyful. This phrase for centuries became a motto for surgeons, because without painkillers and antiseptics their procedures had to be really quick and they tried to create for their patients an atmosphere of safety and joy. The success of Greek physicians led to their increasing status in Rome. In the first century before Common Era, Julius Caesar granted all physicians Roman citizenship. Emperor Augustus was so amazed with the successful treatment of his illness that he granted physicians an immunity from taxes and Emperor Vespasian discharged physicians from military services. All this led to such a great popularity of medical profession in Rome that in 2nd century Common Era the restriction on the number of physicians was imposed and in the 3rd century Common Era medical licensing was introduced because before that anyone could declare himself a physician. The development of the medical profession in Rome led to the formation of three medical strata. Physicians who studied medical theory but rarely came to practice, surgeons who wanted to study only by practice and not waste any time on books, and the middle class which combined theory and practice. Some medical scholars insisted on blurring the line between educated physicians and surgeons that is, those who work with the mind and those who work with the hands. One of the such defenders of combining theory and practice was the Greek scholar Claudius Galen, who was the greatest physician of Roman times and perhaps the most frequently mentioned man in the history of medicine. He was one of the first to advocate the convergency of surgery to science, but that idea was too ahead of its time. The centuries after him, other medics tried to do the same, but only the Enlightenment and the scientific discoveries of the 19th century made it possible to turn surgery into an integral part of scientific medicine. As you already know, Galen was best known for systematizing humoral theory of Hippocrates and other Greek scholars. But besides that, his medical achievements and incredible amount of published books on medicine gained him great fame in Rome, and his ideas became the basis of medicine for many generations of doctors. However, now we know that most of the knowledge that Galen outlined in his books is wrong, 
Almost all of his knowledge of anatomy was gained by dissecting animals, not humans. But in his books, by which physicians studied anatomy for centuries, Galen didn't mention this. When in medieval times universities finally began to study anatomy by dissecting dead human bodies, doctors were surprised that what they saw in reality didn't match with what is written in the textbook. But Galen's authority was so great that these errors were attributed to the changes in human body that have occurred over this long time. Galen's pharmaceutical books have also been used extensively for centuries, although it is now known that most of the drugs in them have not been effective at all, and some of them even harmful. Until the 19th century, wound separation was considered a good sign, because according to Galen, pus on wounds was a sign of healing process, namely the stage at which body is trying to reduce amount of fluids in organism and restore its balance. Galen rejected all progressive ideas of Herophilus and especially hated Erasistratus for his disbelief in humoral theory. But the most devastating effect of Galen's idea on medicine occurred without his personal involvement. Because Galen often repeated in his books that everything developed according to the divine plan, his ideas appealed to Christians, who turned Galen's legacy into an irrefutable religious dogma. Thus, the critique of humoral theory became unthinkable. As a result, advances in medicine have been delayed for several centuries and have hardly developed during the time of the dominance of Christian Church in Europe. But we will talk about this in the next part of the lecture. That is all for today. See you next time.